I wanted to tell you a story about 2023. If we can pull my slides up, please. Uh, about 2023. Um, I, I was thinking of this story. I've never told this story publicly. Uh, but when I was a kid, I was 11 or 12 years old. My brother might remember this. My brother Roman is back there. If you can wave. This is my brother. He came in from Seattle. My dad's next to him. If you guys give him a hand, they came down here. So, so good to have you guys. Um, I had a, a cousin. I was living in Seattle. I grew up in Seattle. And uh, my cousin was from California. He was a cool cousin from California. He was 16. And my cousin, Stephen, loved to skateboard. Any former skateboarders out there that love to skate? Yeah, you look like a skateboarder. Even here, rocket scientist, surfer. Anyway, Chad. Um, but he was amazing. The guy could jump over, like, trash cans, do all these over trash cans. But he was just incredible. He had all these tricks. And my brother and I were, like, not that good, right? We were just, like, kind of new to this, whatever. And so well, we had this amazing hill next to our house and uh, we would just get going on the skateboard and get going really fast. And this was not like a long board. You know, they got these long boards now. You cruise and you're like, oh, this is so cool, whatever. Like, these are like the, the small skateboards with the tails on both sides. You're doing they're like freestyle skateboards. And we're going down. And I, I, don't know if, I don't know if you remember this or this happened to you, but Roman, but I would go down. And I remember just getting these, like starting to get these speed wobbles. You, know, you start going a little too fast. You're going like maybe, maybe 15 miles an hour or something. You really start getting going. And sooner or later, you got to make a decision. You're like, I, I can't quite hang on here. And I've got to either bail, and am I going to, like, try to make it for the bushes on the side of the road? Am I going to try to, like, do a roll, or what's going to, and usually you end up with, like, kind of cuts and bruises and whatever else. And 2023, for some of us, has kind of felt like that a little bit, right? So um, I have a solution, a way that we resolve that. I'm going to come back to that in a minute, so I'm going to leave you with a cliffhanger. But I wanted to share that story because I feel like it fits. Um, this is basically called How to Pr uh, Preserve and Grow Generational Wealth. Um, you see what happens in 2023. We've talked a lot about it here. We've talked about inflation. Even though it's come down, prices haven't come down, right? So that's what people talk about. Oh, inflation's down. It's like, well, prices are still 40, 50 percent more than what they were a couple years ago. Uh, multifamily properties are in distress. We see stock market. We see other inflation things. The fastest uh, rate and in increase, the line on the far left there uh, is, does this have a laser pointer? This doesn't have a laser pointer. It doesn't, oh, no. It does have a laser pointer? Oh, you can, can't see it, though. It's like, okay, okay, got it. Um, <laughs> I'll have to get a nicer one next year. Um, okay, so on the far left there, the yellow line, that's the, uh, the fastest increase basically since around uh, 1980. So it's a super fast increase, so many increases. This is a little bit of my background. Just I think Stephanie shared a little bit. We've raised a bunch of money. We do educational events like this. We also actually do virtual panels. So I've had all of those people that were up here, they've all been on virtual panels. We do them once a month, and you can experience them from the comfort of your home. Uh, we do ATM machines, car washes, oil and gas deals, and we do have a large meetup in Glendale, uh, California. Um, so I wanted to share that. So we're talking about pain in multifamily. We're seeing issues. There's the whole phrase of survive till 25. This is all uh, debts that are maturing uh, in the next couple of years. So we see the far left is 2023, 2024, 2025, that box on the left. So we're seeing a lot of commercial debt starting to prepare to mature. So this is what's causing a lot of pain. We're also seeing rent growth uh, start to slow down. Now it doesn't show negative here, but it's starting to decelerate in a lot of areas where it's not actually growing. Um, and then this is uh, interesting too. The reason I'm sharing this is because it applies to how you preserve your wealth. Um, we see uh, there's a 43% in new M2 currency supply, which is physical currency in bank accounts, as well, excuse me, physical currency printed as well as money in bank accounts. So that little uh, bit on the right there from 2020, that big blip up there, uh, that was basically, uh, we went from uh, 15, I think it was 15 trillion to 22 trillion, or it could be more than that, but it went up 43% uh, just in two years. Um, so saving is losing. So the question really as an investor you should be asking is what, what the heck should I do, right? I don't know if you walk away from a panel, you're like, oh, that was great. Everybody's really smart, but I don't know what to do. Right? So I'm going to give you some practical things. I'm not giving you any specific advice, but these are, these are things that I'm doing to try to position myself to preserve wealth and also to grow wealth. Right? You have two things. You have preservation of capital and you have growth of capital. Right? What's the most important thing? The most important thing, Buffett would say, what? Rule number one of investing is don't lose money. Rule number two is don't forget about rule number one. Right? If whatever you invest in, if you just don't lose money, you'll do phenomenal. Right? Would you agree with that? He's a pretty smart guy. Um, so, you know, if uh, this, these are some enemies of wealth preservation. If you're putting money into something and you're seeing money come out the other side, like the piggy bank has a hole in it. Uh, it's a great illustration there. Um, you know, you have no diversification. I've seen some investors that have all their money in one or two deals. That's very, there's a lot of risk there. Um, and then on the other side, I've seen uh, too much diversification. I've seen some investors that have, uh, you know, over 70 passive deals. 
is in a lot of passive deals, and I won't name names or point fingers, uh, J- Jeremy Rule. Um, but anyway, there's some people that are in a lot of different deals, and they love the diversification. I don't know if he's in the room. Is he gonna, uh, anyway, uh, I'll have to tell him. Okay, so I, I'd say that to his face too. So. Um, but you can be too diversified. It takes a lot of work to manage a lot of different deals if you're in too many deals. How many feel like you're in too many deals? A few people, okay, a couple, okay. Yeah, too many deals, right. So you can be in too many deals. There's also something called counterparty risk. Counterparty risk is if you're invested in a stock, if you're invested in a business, and any of like the financial offering institution or the bank or the business itself or any group uh, has an issue, you lose your money. An example of this, I'm gonna talk about precious metals in a bit. Any precious metals investors out here? Yeah, I love precious metals. There are ETFs that sell precious metals, but the problem with ETFs is that they'll sell, they'll buy one ounce of gold and they'll sell 20 or more shares of it. So what's the problem with that, right? Well, there's no problem until there's a problem and then you're probably not getting paid because if there's an issue with the ETF, there's an issue with the issuer, there's an issue with all of a sudden there's a run on gold, we can't get enough gold, whatever. Well, who doesn't get paid? It's probably you that don't get paid because you're a, a retail investor as opposed to some of the bigger ones. So there's counterparty risk. These are all things to be concerned about. This is a uh, person crossing their fingers behind their back. Uh, this is misaligned interest. Um, I, I, some of you met Mark Kwan that was out here. I think he left. He's, uh, you know, I used to be a registered investment advisor, which is known as an RIA. I now call myself an RAA, which is a recovering investment advisor, because I saw some of these misalignments, right? They get paid no matter what. Even if your portfolio goes down by half, there's misalignment, and so that can be a real enemy of wealth preservation. So strategies for capital uh, preservation, just want to give a couple things here that I found to be helpful. Precious metals are great as an inflation hedge. There's also a great way that you can actually have liquidity. What I mean by that is instead of storing uh, cash in the bank, let's say I have 100000 in savings, instead of just keeping it in a bank account, you can actually buy metals, physical metals, have them shipped to a third-party vault. They will store them for you for a small fee, and then you can borrow against it like a HELOC, uh, for, you know, it's up to 75% loan to value, right? So there's a way you can actually have liquidity while still being an owner of precious metals. There's a 5,000 year history of metals. I don't have time to get into all of this, um, but I think there's actually a great, if anybody's taking notes, there's a phenomenal YouTube series called The Hidden Secrets of Money. Uh, it's a 10 part series, The Hidden Secrets of Money by Mike Maloney. Uh, it changed my mind about precious metals. So it's something, if you haven't considered it, uh, consider it, look into it, watch the first episode. It's about 25 minutes completely changed the way I looked at precious metals. Uh, Another example of loss, you know, if you have an investment loss of 50%, uh, you have 100,000, you lose half of it, you're down to 50,000, you've got to have a 100% gain then. You've got to go from 50K now back to 100K, that's that's 100% gain. So losses are really uh, difficult, right? They're difficult to stomach. And so um, the image is kind of an interesting image there too with the plane. I'm not sure what's going on with the plane, if it's dropping luggage or something, but... um, this is uh, a lot of people we talk to do a lot with stocks. Um, I am, I, you know, I was an investment advisor, so I feel like I'm very passionate about sharing about this, but you'll just see time after time, these safe traditional investments are not safe and traditional. And some of this comes from the book as well uh, that you got, uh, the Wall Street crash of 1939, 1929, excuse me, 89% of its value in 1937, we lost 49% of the value in 1973, 45%. Black Monday in the 80s, 22% in a single day. Dot-com bubble lost 20% in three years. And then in the financial crisis, uh, great GFC, it was 56% over 17 months. So this does not sound like safe, secure investing, right? But this is traditional investing. I want to show this chart to you. Um, This is something a lot of people don't realize is that this chart here, you can see on the far left, this is 1929. Uh, there was a crash. It went down 89%. So today the uh, Dow Jones is at 33,000. If it dropped 89% over the next few years, it means it would be at around 3,300. Would that be shocking to some people, right? Would that be shocking for your retirement account for a lot of people? And then when did it come back? Well, yeah, it'll come back, Ron. So it'll come back. Well, don't worry. Well, it took 25 years from the peak for it to actually come back. That's like if it, if it were to crash today till 2048, it would not come back to where it was, and that doesn't even include inflation. So if you include inflation, it could be another five, 10 years after that. So these are, there was a time in here between 1933, and I know I'm in an alternative asset con- a conference, I'm talking about real estate, but I just want you to be aware of this too. From 1933 out, there was a time where people would just be like, oh my gosh, why would you do stocks? So again, Wall Street has trained us to think these are safe and traditional, but that's why we call them real assets, right? Because they're actually physical, they're real. Uh, this other stuff is, uh, is not safe. So you can also make poor investment choices. There's been some talk of this too. Inexperienced operators, 
speculative investments, uh, investing against the trends. If you're investing in an area where the population is shrinking, uh, maybe you're betting against the senior demographic. I'm not quite sure how you would do that, but if there's a way, you know, the senior demographic is growing, but if you found a way that you were somehow investing against that, that would not be a good way to go. So, okay, so that's preservation. Those are things that uh, you know, we're doing to try to protect wealth, to try to protect the wealth that we have. Uh, I mentioned some strategies there. And then I want to just get into a few things on how, these are ideas that you can use, right? I always think when I go to a conference, what's the one or two ideas? What are the one, two things I need to do a little work when I get back or do a little research? These are things and assets that I'm really excited about. Again, I'm not necessarily endorsing any of them. Some of these we do have deals in, but I want to at least uh, just give you something that you can walk away with. It. Like, hey, here's something I actually take with me to be able to use. So... Um, this is, uh, you know, in, in, I love inflation, adjust, inflation hedge, sorry, the screens are having a little trouble seeing, inflation hedge assets, um, multifamily was mentioned, Neil mentioned this as well, we're short, this article down here in the fine print says 7.2 million, this one says we're short 6.5 million, it's somewhere between 4 and 8 million, we're short uh, that many housing units, so it's an inc incredibly in demand, and some of you that are apartment investors is like, that's the case, why are prices going down? Why are we having issues? Well, the demand is there. It's just, it's, it's a lot of it's the debt issue that we're really dealing with right now. Um, this is one of my favorite charts. Uh, if you look at this chart, the red line is rents since 1960 up till about 2020. And then you see that little dotted line that is inflation. So there's not a direct correlation, but it's very close. You see how, you know, over time, generally inflation rises, rents rise. So being in an inflation hedged asset such as multifamily or other commercial real estate can be really, really advantageous. I uh, also love self-storage. Uh, this is a, a fun fact. There are more self-storage locations in the U.S. than there are Starbucks, Burger King, and McDonald's restaurants combined. Is that shocking? Think about it. Think about all the McDonald's, all the rest. Some of you guys know where all the, the but you know, we don't see these. We just don't, you know, our eyes don't kind of perk to them, but they're actually more than all of them combined. And you can actually raise rents easier than you can multifamily. People will typically, uh, thank you, after um, a, you know, a small rent increase, if, you know, you raise 5% every six months, uh, most people will not rent a truck and go move to a different location. So self-storage is a great investment. Um, I do have some personal self-storage. We don't have anything we off have offered in self-storage, but I like that one. Uh, we've done some oil and gas deals. I want to just touch on this. I love oil and gas deals. I know in California, a lot of people are like, oh, you should, um, you know, not consume any energy. You should have nothing, but everything consumes energy. And um, this is really interesting. Asset managers commit $16 trillion uh, to net zero target. And what does that mean? It's basically they're trying to get to a zero net emissions where they're not producing any emissions at all. And what that has really led to is that a lot of these funds don't do development. So on this chart, you can see on the left here, this is up till 2014, we're seeing almost $80 billion a year in new drilling, offshore and onshore drilling. And then you get to the right and it's, look how it just like drops off a cliff. And we're basically at about 20 billion. So it's four times less. So we have way, way less exploration, less drilling, less all this, and our needs are going way up. So it's saying, you know, over the next uh, number of years, uh, by 2045, we're going to have 110 barrels per day, 110 uh, million barrels per day uh, for demand. We're at, uh, I think, around uh, close to 100 uh, million right now. I think this could be a little conservative, but it's going to only continue to go up. So how is that going to work, right? Things are going to go up. We need more oil. We need more consumption. We need more of this. Um, and this book right here, actually, didn't, it kind of got really jacked up on the thing. Anyway, it's called The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. Um, this book, it's, it's not a long book, but it basically says because we use fossil fuels, um, our lives are way better. And I can give specific examples of that. There was an example given of a, a basically in a hospital, uh, a baby died uh, in a hospital because though they had the piece of equipment they needed, they did not have re a reliable power source and there was a brown outage at the time they needed to, and it's, and it's just heartbreaking, right? Anybody has kids, you think about things like that. But because we're able to have clean, reliable, or you know, reliable energy, sometimes it's clean, sometimes it's not, but this, this kind of puts it, puts it in a different framework instead of just preserving everything. A lot of people would say, hey, you shouldn't build anything, you should just preserve everything. This is saying, how can we maximize human flourishing so we all have a better experience and a great environment is a part of that. So that's why one of the reasons I love uh, oil and gas investments because there's a huge underinvestment by a lot of the big players. Um, ATM fund, ATM fund investing, we have an ATM fund that we work with, uh, consistent monthly cash flow, 100% uh, depreciation, uh, and you know, deals we've done, it's actually been better than real estate depreciation, and what I mean by that is real estate depreciation, we can bring it forward to year one, you know, you can depreciate and you accelerate the depreciation to year one, but what happens, you know, it's usually a 27 and a half year or 20 plus year schedule, you have to recapture whatever years when you sell. So if you sell in five years, 
you've got to re you kind of get penalized on the back end. With ATM machines or other businesses like this, you actually, um, you never have to recapture. So we've had some investors come in and be very, very pleased with that. Uh, we've raised quite a bit of money for that. Fast return of capital and there's stability when working with a solid operator. Um, okay, this is, a lot of people wonder, is anybody using uh, ATMs anymore, right? Because I don't use ATMs. I don't pay for ATMs, right? I mean, except when I was in Japan, I did an ATM machine and paid a fee, but here I don't. But there is a segment of the population, we're actually seeing incredible growth uh, this is showing from 20, uh, 2021 to 2028, I believe this is from this year, but it shows the growth and the projected growth, about 4.3 uh, compound annual growth rate per year. So who is actually using these? Um, it really is, uh, actually, I don't have a chart for it, but there's basically about 10% of the U.S. population that does not even have a bank account. Isn't that shocking? One out of 10 people living in the U.S. doesn't have a bank account. So what are they doing? They're operating in cash. They're getting paid under the table. They're using prepaid debit cards. So we're seeing, like there's this chart here, we're seeing transactions actually significantly increase. Um, so we have, we actually do some work in this space. So if you're interested in getting connected on that, we do some um, work in the ATM space. Uh, private equity roll-ups. I like this. It kind of reminds me of the, uh, the fruit roll-up. I uh, used to use fruit roll-ups when you were a kid. This idea of like rolling it up and unrolling. It was kind of fun. Um, but, you know, a private equity roll-up, how it works is if you have one car wash, this is a, an article from the Wall Street Journal about private equity wants to wash your car. You have one car wash, it will sell for typically around eight to 10 times earnings, or if you have up to 10 of these. If you have 50 car washes that are of similar type, it will sell typically for 15 to 25 times earnings, right? So there's simply value of putting more of the same thing together. Right, and well, why is that? Well, who's gonna buy it? Private equity wants to buy it, right? They, they don't wanna pay 10 million for one, they wanna spend 500 million and buy 50 of them. They wanna buy more of them, right? So this strategy is awesome, and this exists in dental practices, car washes, retail fran franchises, all kinds of different things. We've seen it in gas stations, different things. That's kind of a unique strategy as well. So I'm giving you kind of high level here. We're not pitching any specific deal, but I think this stuff is helpful just for you to get about, be aware of. So when you see or you hear about it, somebody doing a deal in this space, you can kind of perk up and say, hey, this would be interesting to look into. Talked about precious metals. Now this is about growing wealth. I just wanted to kind of point this out. Um, you look at the uh, two lines here. The red line is the price of gold over the years since 1975, I believe is on the left, 1975, and that uh, uh, the blue line is the M2 money supply. That's money in bank accounts or physical cash. It almost follows a line. It's a little bit rocky, but uh, there was a time on the left of that screen there, it was actually uh, gold became legal to own again in the U.S. It was actually illegal for about 40 years, but it became legal, and it had about a 25x increase in the price between 1974 and 1980. So there's also some potential there. The more currency they pr print, they can't just create more gold, right? And there's kind of, the, we're seeing this driving demand for uh, internationally for gold. Um, also, I love this thought. This is, I call these exponential investments. Um, now this is something, it's not for everybody. This is typically for somebody who has a net worth of two million or more, but um, you know, what, these are investments that could go 10X or 100X, right? So most of the deals we've done have been steady cash flow type of deals where it's like, hey, you're getting paid regularly. But if there's a deal for, I know of a couple of deals where uh, you know, there's a potential 100x return. Now, there's always going to be a higher risk in that, right? So we've had one deal we did like that, and I was like, I tell investors, hey, there's probably a 50% chance we could have a total loss in this, right? So somebody's got to have a place in it for it. But if you had at the bottom, if you had 100k invested, and you had a 100x return, you would have $10 million. So how this could work for someone, not for you, but for someone, right? Theoretically, no advice. Uh, $5 million net worth, let's just say your net worth is 5 million. You took 10% of your net worth, and you, would, you have to agree that you would want to do that, and you'd put that into maybe uh, you know, 500K into five different deals at 100K each, right? And maybe four of them, nothing really happens, they don't do well, but one of those deals, you do have a 10X or 100X type return, right? If it was 100X, you would go, basically your net worth would basically go from five million to 15 million, right? So that's, that's substantial. So something to consider, uh, again, for people with higher net worth as things like venture capital, uh, there's private equity, there's smaller types of deals, there's some unique things that are out there uh, called exponential investments. I wanna share this with you. If you haven't done this is my uh, ebook. I'm, I'm of the opinion that inflation is actually much higher than the official stated rates of uh, in the threes, I think it's 3.5%-ish. I think it's more like seven and a half, eight percent uh, but this is just some strategies that you can use to, uh, to, to utilize to use inflation to your advantage. Um, 
And uh, I don't know if we have time for questions. Here's my information. I wanted to just make a quick announcement here at the end. If you did not get a book uh, at the registration table, we have more of these books. Uh, really appreciate each of your support for being here. And I uh, just want to thank you. We have uh, a couple more things coming up, and then we're going to get to the uh, socializing. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you.